Hi! In this tutorial, I'm going to show you one of many ways of making force field type effects using 3D software called Maya. What you see on screen right now are some of the examples of visual effects work that I've done for film and television throughout recent years. Every force field effect ends up being a little bit different, but there are some visual qualities that they all share. Typically, in our minds, the force fields are associated with some sort of optical distortion and glow, and those will be the two main components that we will focus on for the duration of this tutorial. Even though the majority of this effect will be done using Maya's built-in toolset, we will be requiring one additional plugin called Soup. It can be downloaded for free from soup-dev.com. I will be posting any necessary links in the video description. The plugin package is located inside the tool section of the website. Click the download link, save the archive, unzip it, and inside you will find instructions as to where every file is supposed to go. Inside Maya, you will be able to load the plugin by going to Settings and Preferences, Plugin Manager, and locating soup.mll in the plugin list. By clicking the Load button, you will have access to Soup Shelf, and by clicking on the first icon, you will be able to see all of the soup nodes that come with the plugin. I'm going to use the scene that I set up earlier. First, I will make myself a polygonal cube. It can be any polygonal geo. I'm using cube because the shape of my spaceship is roughly rectangular. Next, I'm going to give the cube a few more subdivisions, and that is to be able to use face selection and cut off the bottom section of it, turning it into a hemisphere, which will resemble our final force field. However, right now there aren't enough subdivisions for gentle deformation. To do that, I have to go to polygonal menu, mesh, smooth, and we'll give it a few more subdivisions. The default value of 2 isn't enough, so I'm going to crank it uh, to about 5. Uh, to me this looks just about right. Eventually we're going to turn this hemisphere into a cloth object. But for now, I'm examining it, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out, so I'm just going to go ahead and clear its deformation history by going to Edit, Delete by Type, History. And I check the inputs to make sure that there's no junk left there. I'm also going to rename the object for organizational purposes. I'll call it uh, Force Field Geo. The next step is very important. You have to select the geo, right click on it, and go to Color Sets, Color Set Editor, and hit New. Don't change any of the default values, just hit Apply and Close, and close it again. And what this did is it added an extra set of values associated with every vertex of the geometry. Uh, those uh, buffers will be used later on in order to transmit color information from the soup node into the metal ray shader. And we're practically ready to create our first cloth object. I'm going to go into end dynamics menu and you know what? I'm not actually going to turn this geo into cloth. I'm going to hit Control D and create a duplicate of it. I like keeping the original unchanged and hidden, just in case I mess something up and I have to go back to it later. To create end cloth, have the object selected, go to end mesh, create end cloth. By default, if you hit playback, you will see that the cloth is falling through the ground, and that is because it's being affected by the force of gravity. To fix that, select end cloth, hit Ctrl A. Inside the shape tab, you will find one attribute called ignore solver gravity. Enable it. Hit playback to check the results. This time the cloth remains stationary, just as we want it. So we're ready to proceed on to the next step. And now it's time to prepare a cloth for collisions. Just to test it, I'm going to create myself a fresh polygonal cube, and I will turn it into a passive collider, simulating a very heavy projectile that will be flying at the force field. Of the object selected, I go to end mesh and create passive collider. Uh, then I'll put a few keyframes on it to simulate a very fast moving projectile. I'm just gonna play it and see what happens. Hmm, quite an interesting result, yet not exactly the type of effect that we're trying to achieve. Hmm, maybe the projectile is too heavy. What if I replace this big cube with a bunch of tiny end particles? I go create emitter and uh, I'll take the emitter outside the force field and change its emission type from default omni to let's say directional one. 
right now it's pointing in the direction x and I need it to be pointing in the direction z. So I'll zero out the x component, set z to 1, uh, give it a little bit of spread. 0 0.2 sounds just about right. And I'll increase the speed to 50 uh, units per second and hit play. See what happens. Uh, the cloth is still being dragged around. Perhaps I have too many particles. Let's reduce the emission count by going to its emitter and lowering it to, I don't know, 24 particles per second. There's a bit of improvement. However, at this point, I don't like the way that my particles look. I'm going to change them to streaks. I'll go to particle shape, locate shading attributes, and change particles to streaks. I will increase tail fade to one, and that will make them look more like proper projectiles, or maybe short laser beams. The last problem to address is the fact that when particles bounce off, they just float into infinity. To fix that, go to Particle Collision Events and hit Original Particle Dies. Now if I play it again, you will see that particles will just get absorbed by the cloth the moment they impact. Lastly, have your cloth selected and locate an attribute called Input Mesh Attract. If you set that value very high and play this simulation, you will see that the cloth will be very resistant to deformation. Uh, what we need is a little bit of influence of the original non-deformed object and a little bit of freedom. In this case, the value of 0.2 will allow the cloth to deform, yet will keep it from floating away into infinity. I will temporarily disable X-ray shading and examine our force field from all directions to make sure that it's acting the way that I'm expecting it to act. And being happy with all the deformations, I'm slowly going to start preparing the shader. We're going to be using Mental Ray to construct our final force field effect. With the end cloth selected, open Hypershade and click on Display Input and Output Connections. What you will see is a schematic representation of the cloth simulation. You will see the original shape that passes information through the end cloth node and produces a deformed out shape. We will need both of them to create the final shader. For the next step, go to your soup shelf Left click on the soup bowl icon and find a node called Tension Map. Click on it. It'll add a new shape node to the hypershade. By default, it will already be linked to the end cloth object you had selected. Next, select the grayed out shape node, then the soup node, and then the shelf button that looks like a power plug. In the list, select the second option. What we have done is provide the two necessary shape inputs for the Tension Map node to function. However, we will still require a shape output, one that will contain all of the information collected. Make sure that your shape option is enabled inside the outliner. Next, middle mouse drag force field geo shape into the hypershade. Shift select the soup node, then the shape that we just brought in, hit the power plug button and the only option available. Now, select your cloth and hide it by hitting Ctrl H and unhide the original geo by hitting Shift H. If you play the simulation again, you will see it the way that it was before. It will appear that nothing has changed, even though in reality what you see is no longer the cloth object. It is actually the original geo that is receiving the deformations of the cloth through the soup node. What was the point of all that? Well, when deformations pass through the tension map node, they are encoded as color information and stored inside the color set, something that we created at the beginning of this tutorial. You can find them inside mesh controls, inside current color set, but they're still not visible. How do we make them visible? We have to go into mesh component display and find a checkbox that says display colors. If you click on it and the object turns green, that means that you've done everything correctly so far. Next, expand the hypershade panel. Select the tension map node and go to its attributes. If you scroll up, you will find the tab called Point Color. The three sliders will represent the color of the surface that is not being deformed, the color of the surface that is being compressed, that's the second slider, and the color of the surface that is being stretched. Right now, the node is set to analyze distance, which means the difference between position of the initial and the final shape. 
the value of 2 isn't enough, but you can always type in a custom one. If I increase the value to 10 for the compression and 10 for stretching, then we will start seeing a little bit of color in the viewport. However, the distance solver isn't too practical for what we're doing. Let's change it to in-between angle. Now the color is much more vibrant, as it represents not only the distance traveled by each vertex, but also the direction, and that tracks the shape of the ripples quite well. I think the effect ended up looking pretty neat. But what will it render like? Will it render at all? Everything that we've been looking at so far has been in the viewport. Now it's time to hit render globals and go back to the hypershade one more time. Here I'm double checking to make sure that I'm set to render a metal ray. Everything checks out. I'm gonna keep everything on default. And hit my render preview. And what does it look like? It looks like absolutely nothing. Completely gray, not a touch of color. What's going on? The truth is that we never actually assigned any shader material to our object. It is still being rendered with the default Lambert, as everything else. So let's go back to Hypershade and create a force field material. I prefer Blin for this type of effect. I'm going to rename it and I will call it FF underscore text for force field texture. And I will go to its attributes by double clicking. The force field that I'm going for is going to be primarily transparent. So I'm going to crank transparency all the way up to 100%. Got to remember to assign material to the object. Uh, am I forgetting anything else? Well, you see that spec. I think I'm not going to have any specularity in my force field. I'm going to zero out reflectivity and specular color. And we'll do a test preview to see what it looks like. And it looks like even less of a force field. All I can see is shadow that's being cast by it. I'll temporarily lower the transparency and check it again to make sure that it's there. Oh yes, the hemisphere is still there. It's just not doing anything but cast a shadow. And that will be an issue for me actually. So I'll bring transparency back up and I want to locate render attributes of this object. I want to make sure that it doesn't receive shadows and doesn't cast shadows. Now, where would that attribute be? I'm looking for render stats. Oh, there it is. I don't want it to cast shadows and I don't want it to receive shadows. Uh, visible in refractions or fractions, I'll temporarily disable those just to make renders go faster. In the end, you might want to re-enable them. That will make the effect look better. Next, I'm going back into Hypershade. I'm looking for a specific mental ray node. It is called Mental Ray Vertex Colors, and that is one node that is able to pass vertex color information from the geometric object into the blend that we have set up as our force field. All right, I'm going to drag it aside, and I'm going to bring in force field geo shape into the hypershade. Then middle mouse drag from the shape node into the mental ray shader and I'll open the connection editor. The attribute that I'm looking for is located inside color set. Color set zero, you have to expand it. It's called color name. You have to connect it to CPV sets. Just click on it, it'll automatically create a subsection. At this point, half of our shader work is done. Drag the window aside, uh, locate your blend material, let's drag it into view, and middle mouse drag from the vertex color shader, and let's map it into incandescence. That way the color that we see in the viewport should end up glowing the material when we render it. Let's hit a render preview. Yep, just as we expected. The color is now being translated into incandescence and it lights up the scene. At this point I'm thinking that in addition to glow it would be nice to have a little bit of refraction. Sure it can be done in post-production, but let's try and get maximum results straight out of Maya. Uh, let me go to my blend material and temporarily disconnect the color information from it. I do it by selecting the link and hitting the delete button on my keyboard. Then I go back into blend attributes and go into the refraction section. If I enable refractions, by default 
the value of refractive index is set to 1, which means that light rays that pass through the object do not get bent at all. So, even though I have refractions enabled here and in my render globals, if I do a quick render preview, what will we see? We will see no effect whatsoever. Uh, if we, however, increase our refractive index to something like 1.333, which is refractive index of water, and render it again, we'll immediately see that refraction is actually happening. You will see that the glass bowl acts as a giant lens magnifying the spacecraft inside of it and even affecting the floor pattern. What we want is the color information that we have driving the incandescence to also drive the refractive index of the material. How do we do that? We will need one extra node called plus minus average and I'm trying to locate it in the list right now. There it is. Yes, there it is. I will middle mouse drag it into the view, arrange it a little bit closer to my mental ray vertex color node, and middle mouse drag from the mental ray color node onto the... Oh wait, I forgot, I have to create myself two inputs inside the plus minus average node. I'll do it in the input 2D section. Um, the reason I do that is because I want the default refraction value to be one and not zero like as you can see on the force field right now everything that is black would produce a refractive index of zero and i don't want that i want everything that is black to actually have a value of one when it passes onto the shader i middle mouse drag from the vertex color node onto plus minus average i expand the connections editor and i connect the blue color into the first component of the input 2d array i expand it like that and I find my first input. And the moment that I click on it, I will see the selection highlight yellow. That means that there is an incoming value. The second value, I will set it to one. That way, every black value of the force field will produce a refractive index of one, and everything that is brighter than black will actually act more like water. Now, middle mouse drag from the vertex color node onto the blend shader and locate output of the 2D array. You need the X component. The X component will become our refractive index. Scroll down and locate refractive index. Click on it and you will be all set. Now we are ready to do another render preview and to see whether refractions are working. And you can see uh, we still don't have incandescence connected but refraction is working perfectly. Everything that's being hit by our projectiles is getting distorted, but everything at the back of the spacecraft is perfectly transparent. Now all I have to do is reconnect incandescence exactly the way it was before and do another render preview for combined effect. Now we can see both incandescence and refraction acting at the same time at the front of the spaceship and we have nothing at the back. To make the glow of the force field more prominent, you can always go into indirect lighting tab into final gathering subsection and I already pre-tweaked mine. I increased primary diffuse value to 10 from the default value of 1 to make sure that the force field really lights up the scene. Uh, let's see what it looks like with final gathering. And you see that extra glow. It works much better than the shader glow that's built into most materials because it's not a fake 2D process. It actually ends up lighting up 3D objects in your scene and interacting with the environment. One last tweak that I would like to make is get rid of this ugly interception line that happens where the force field meets the ground plane. To do that, I'm not going to touch the shader. I will go back into the end cloth controls and reduce the amount of deformation that is happening near the bottom end of the cloth bubble. I will hide my object that I'm rendering and temporarily re-enable visibility of the cloth object. Then I will go into the side view and select the bottom two rows of vertices of the cloth object. Then I will locate end constraints, one called transform. I will set it and I will not even adjust any of the default values. I'll go right back into the perspective view. Our simulation is not cached, so all the changes that we do will be updated live. If I play the simulation again, you will see that the bottom two rows of vertices remain perfectly still. 
And now once again, I re-enable the visibility of original geo, hide my cloth object, and play the simulation to make sure that nothing got broken in the process of me adjusting the parameters. As you can see, the bottom set of vertices is still planted right on the ground and the color fades off much more gently, which will produce much better effect when the time comes to render it. One more visual check at the render level to make sure that the ground plane issue has been resolved and looks like it was. I'm going to save this image and get ready to render the whole sequence. By the way, in this scene I used blue and red colors to represent stretching and compression of the force field, but you're not confined to those colors. You can always go back to the tension map node and under point color, color coding, you can find different combinations of colors that may better suit your needs. You can have blue, red and green listed in almost any combination. There's also a grayscale value that averages all three colors together. It is least useful for the force field type effects, but I still suggest that you play around with all of them. The tension map node has many features and I'm using it for force fields, but it has tons of different applications. I will cover them more in future tutorials. And now it's time to show you the finished product, the rendered image sequence with the force field effect. If you have any questions, comments or requests for future tutorials, please post them in the comment section. See ya!